Good morning. Thank you all for coming. And what we'd like to do is um, just share some best practices with you. Um, I have been uh, using service learning for two semesters now in my classes, and I've had some wonderful, wonderful experiences, but probably one of the best experiences <laughs> has been with Dave. And Dave and I are, uh, somehow or another, one of, one of my students just ambled into MAD. Dave is from MAD, which is, of course, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. And one of my students ambled into MAD, and somehow it worked out so well that Dave then developed this entire program and um, from that point on, Dave has just been wonderful. He will actually come to the campus and he'll work with the students and he'll get all the papers signed and check on the students and so on and so forth. Um, we're gonna talk, both of us are gonna talk about how this works out. Um, on my end, what I have done is I, have, as I said before, I teach sociology and I have the students write um, two papers. Um, they're going to give me a uh, first written assignment is when they're going to integrate 10 terms. They're to volunteer eight hours and then they're going to integrate 10 terms and they get the terms from the back of the sociology text. Now the job is they're going to integrate these terms with actual experience they had while they were working on their service learning project. So in other words, what happens is they volunteer eight hours, say for example, with MAD and then what, what their job is in the paper is to pick out 10 terms and then use those terms um, and, and illustrate how they actually saw this unfold during their service learning experience. Uh, the other paper that they submit to me is a paper that will um, talk about their experience, they assess their experience, they tell me what they thought, how, you know, how things turned out, uh, and then they'll give me suggestions for how to improve the project. Uh, but what I'd like, I'm going to turn it over to Dave, and what I'd like Dave to talk about will be how he, on his end, what they've done at MAD to develop a whole program for my sociology students. So, Absolutely. Dave. Good morning. Good morning. Everybody good? I feel like there's a huge moat between us, don't y'all? <laughs> yeah. So uh, I'll try to whisper loudly. Um, I'm with Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Yes, I'm a mother who's mad um, <laughs> at, at people who choose to drink and get behind the wheel and kill your children and mine. Um, that's pretty tough. But everyone knows MAD, everybody thinks they know MAD. Let me go ahead and dispel two myths immediately. We are not an abolitionist group. We are not against drinking. Uh, and we're also not against driving. We support people <laughs> driving somewhere. But we don't like for the two to be put together because then people are killed. Um, we do not say drunk driving accidents. We say drunk driving crashes. We feel it is not an accident that someone chooses to drink and then get behind the wheel thinking that nothing's ever gonna happen. Uh, Harris County, from really from Montgomery through Harris into Fort Bend County is still known as the drunk driving capital of the United States. And so that alarming, when Brittany Harris called says, I have to do, I love that, I have to do so many hours for a class that I'm in, and I saw you online, and I immediately said, who's your teacher and how can I reach her? I immediately emailed Dr. Fasulo, who corrected me to call her Cheryl, and we have become friends and have become true co-workers. It's my responsibility as an agency to find out what you, your teachers, what your faculty specifically per project needs to enhance their education experience. It's not about them coming to our office, filing, answering phones, looking at videos. It's got to be a practical, hands-on experience for those students. So we went through the first semester. We learned that because our offices are out by Intercontinental Airport, it knocked a lot of people out. It knocks me out. But, um, so then I said, that's fine, I'll come to the campus. And so now I go to campuses and Sanjak's system has just been amazing for us in that they give us a room, we meet with the students, we give them an orientation about the three things that MAD does. We will, will eliminate one day drunk driving in the United States and in the world. Secondly, we're the world's largest resource and source to help victims and their families of drunk driving. And third, we want to prevent underage drinking. So after the first semester, we learned probably more than the students did. We revamped it and then we actually created what we call the Fasulo Project. I know the word. Everybody else says, what's that That project? So we have to name it something Smith or something. Right. But I put a copy of it in your packet for you 
just so you can see, and this is based on a sociology assignment. And so when you look at this, just very quickly, I'll tell you, this project, as we, we developed it so that it's flexible for the student's schedule, they do not have to come to our office or work with us between 9 and 5 any day, just Monday through Friday. That's not the student life. It's got to be when they can get to it, when they can do it after hours or in between classes, what have you. They also, in this project, as you look at it, it covers all three of our mission as far as recognizing and finding and appreciating people who deal with drunk driving, uh, law enforcement officers, judges, uh, hospital personnel, a lot of, we give them a list for that. It also, while they're visiting with people about, and they ask a question like this. So do this with me, please, ladies and gentlemen. If you have ever known anyone, a family member or a friend that's been killed by a drunk driver, would you raise your hand for me right now? Look around the room. Keep it up. Raise it like we're in a Pentecostal church. <laughs> Look around at how many people there are. And so then, thank you. So students then, in doing this, the very last sheet on here is a survey that we had two students get a table in front of the library, and as students walk by, they just pulled them and asked them these questions. The results are this. Because of this project, and because of us doing this together, it has become so successful for us. Um, they have identified, and they have contacted in law enforcement and all that, these sociology students from one teacher's class that's assigned to them, one teacher's semester, they have been in contact with over 330 law enforcement officers and, all, and say to them, do you know what MAD does? Do you need MAD materials? And they fill out that form. I get all those back, and then we send packets to them to help them help victims of drunk driving. One of the, the cool things too, in random surveys, I've gotten in a little bit over 400 of the surveys that they did that tells us people don't know that it's mothers against drunk driving, not mothers against drunk drivers. And it really clarifies us in our marketing. The most exciting thing for us is the center section, they've also identified over 147 victims that MAD had never been in contact with because then we can reach out to them and say, what do you need? What can we do? Would you be willing to come and speak about your drunk driving experience to help change high school students' lives? I get some nice comments. Cheryl gave me a gift a little bit ago of some things that students had written and mentioning what they've learned. We're conquering with the students without telling them. We're also educating them and putting them right in the trenches so that maybe they too will make better decisions against drink, drunk driving and drinking underage. This has been so successful for us that it's in final review now with the president and with the board of MAD that this project that you have in your packet is going to be uh, rewritten and re-released so that when people all over the United States want to volunteer but they can't come into the office or they don't have the time, this is now going to be, this project from her class is now going to be recognized by every MAD office nationwide and to be a project that can be done for victim services and saving people's lives specifically with students. So I'm a big fan, big, big fan. Um, we have, the, this is the results from our experience with, with Cheryl. We love it. We really have enjoyed it. We've had some really good experiences with that. There have been several of your students who have identified themselves as being someone who is a victim of drunk driving. Um, I have in the packet also several other opportunities. We have programs that will write specifically if you have someone in, in dealing with children's issues, dealing with law enforcement, Dealing, and we have a lot of flexibility, a lot of uh, the programs can be done even after 11 o'clock at night, whether you go in and talk to police officers. I put a lot of brochures in there for you from that. But MAD, honestly, we, this has been one of the most successful things that we've done. How's that? Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll hear from some other people on our panel. You want to talk about child care? Absolutely. I've also worked with a child care center, <coughs> and um, that's been very rewarding because sometimes um, one of the challenges, uh, Pandora was mentioning a little while ago, um, one of the challenges is, you know, students want to participate in a service learning project, but they don't have transportation. You know, they, they, their parents will drop them off and pick them up, and that's that. I mean, they don't have the, the means to get anywhere uh, to do the service learning project. So what I've done is I've... Um, requested that the child care center, the library, some of the, the, and the student success center, some of the facilities on campus make themselves available for those students who, are, who, ha who have limited transportation uh, resources. Child care center is one of the biggest areas that has just been wonderful. They've been wonderful to work with. They've been very, very helpful. 
Um, a lot of our students will go into the child care center and, and, and will work their eight hours of service learning and then come out and, and do the assignments. So we'll hear from <coughs> the person from the, the, the yes. child care center. Good morning. My name is Danette Prater, and I currently work at the child care facility here on campus on South. Um, I have about 17 years experience working with young children, so they are my passion. Um, we work with a lot of um, service learning students um, from sociology, <coughs> um, reading classes, uh, teaching um, classes, um, send their students over. We, we have a very, very good rapport with the students. Um, I think that we're very fun and challenging and we're a relevant um, situation because no matter which field that you are to go into, um, the fact is, is that someday about 90% of these students will become parents. So, um, you know, if they're not relevant learning about classroom techniques from the teaching field, um, nursing students come to us and they learn about um, what's normal child development versus what is abnormal child development. Um, sociology classes um, and psychology classes learn about like Erickson's theories about trust and mistrust and they have those real life experiences to tie those things to. Um, all of the teachers at the um, child care facility have at least an associate's degree in um, early childhood development, so we help them out to um, kind of steer them in the right direction and, and, you know, they ask us questions and they survey us and whatnot. Um, as you can imagine, we, we service about 65 children on a daily basis. Um, we're very close by, so it's pretty convenient, as you said, for some of the people that don't have transportation. Um, um, and what happens is, is that they come in there and a lot of the students will find out one of two things. This is not really for me. This is not what I want to do um, for the rest of my life. Or, um, as we have right now, we have two part-time um, employees that actually started as student, um, as service learners. And so some of them really find that they enjoy themselves. And even if they don't um, obtain a a part-time position with us, they will volunteer time. And we're a very busy place, as you can imagine. So we have lots of things um, to keep them busy. So we try to pair the students with what their interest is and tie that back to the curriculum and what it is that they need to take from that experience. So um, we're, just, we're just happy to have your students. Um, we do require a background check um, in the child care facility. We are regulated by the state of Texas. So that is important for you to know if you send our students over. It takes typically 24 to 48 hours for us to get those black background checks back. Any um, drunk driving, that wouldn't work. Um, any offenses against families, we can't accept those people, but um, they don't have to pay for that. The college actually pays for that. And like I said, it takes 24 to 48 hours. It is of the utmost importance to protect our children and invest in our future. And um, we think we're doing that with the service learning students as well as the students and the children in our care. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, to give, to relate to what uh, Ms. Prater just said, the reading college prep reading students who have participated in the child care uh, developmental learning center uh, have benefited greatly. Uh, my students uh, do their service learning and then they select articles to read that relate to some issues that they identify while they're doing their service learning. And the, st the students, of course, they're reading students, so they enjoy reading to the students, uh, at the, the children at the child care center. Uh, even my students who aren't such great readers feel empowered because they can read to the little children. <coughs> uh, it's great interaction for them, social interaction, communication, their communication skills are developed, and I think it instills a value of reading. You know, a lot of students who don't like to read don't value reading, and that may sound real simple, but it's an affective kind of internal change that takes place, and it's, it's so important to have students value reading because then that increases their uh, desire to read. Uh, also, as well, as uh, mentioned, my students have developed an understanding of children and of their developmental stages. So many of the students, when they choose articles, they choose articles that relate to developmental processes. I have some students who are interested in becoming teachers, and they select articles that relate to what you do as an instructor there, and uh, what techniques at certain ages, what are age-appropriate <coughs> instructional methods for certain students. 
and I've gotten the response on, in their reflection papers that I know now that this is my chosen career. This is my vocation. I love teaching. I have a passion uh, for teaching. So it's very inspirational. It's really wonderful to watch a child's eyes light up because most importantly, they want someone to pay attention to them. And um, we offer ch um, quality childcare, but everybody knows there are not enough hands to go around when you have little people. And so it's very valuable to a three or four year old whose parent works all day and comes home and does dinner and bath and that. It's very valuable to have someone to sit one-on-one -on -one with them and read a simple book to them. It's very valuable that somebody pays attention to them. So um, the simple tasks, the most simple of tasks are the most meaningful for our children. Yeah, um, last summer, let me just give you a little background. Last summer at uh, one of the president's meetings, we were trying to plan the in-service program for, uh, for last August's uh, campus in-service. And we were trying to come up with a theme, a topic, an idea, and um, uh, we, a couple of things were coming, through the, coming down the pipeline that we were aware of um, related to our veterans on campus. Um, we have a, a little over 400 veteran students on our campus, and I don't know if you're aware, but we have a, a pretty large number of veterans on staff and faculty as well. Um, in fact, we have a higher percentage of both students and faculty who are veterans than the other two campuses. Um, so we knew that. We knew that we were about to be identified as a, as a veteran-friendly campus, but we had already been identified as a military-friendly campus. So uh, we, we have a str strong veterans focus on, on our campus. We knew that we were receiving the grant to uh, build out the uh, Center for Veteran Student Success, which is opening in May in the administration building, kind of above my office, where the old CETL was. Um, so we knew that we were doing that. We knew that we were going to hire a full-time coordinator for veteran services. So we just thought, wow, this, this is obviously a theme that's developing, so what can we do for veterans? Well, uh, I have a good friend uh, who actually came out and spoke at the in-service, if you remember, who works with homeless veterans uh, with the VA here in Houston. And he, in fact, was a homeless veteran uh, at some time, so uh, had, a real, had a real connection with that. So I, I suggested maybe we have some sort of focus on that. And we developed the, uh, the, the Veterans for Backpack Project, if you remember that, um, or the Backpacks for Veterans Project, sorry. Um, for last fall, and that became a service learning project. It wasn't only a service learning project because many of our staff uh, and faculty were involved uh, with collecting items as well, but many classes uh, incorporated that into their, into their coursework as a service learning project. Um, my classes, I just had it as an as option, and some individual students uh, uh, participated by putting items. We had toiletries mostly, but some people collected bus passes. We had phones contributed, all so cell phones, all sorts of things that were contributed to these and we uh, d wanted to deliver those to uh, homeless veterans in the Houston area. And we, uh, so we looked up, we researched some different agencies, we were already aware of some of them, and uh, DeGeorge at Union Station was one of the agencies that we looked up. In the <coughs> fall for the backpack project, we wound up not connecting with DeGeorge because we had all, or most of our backpacks, um, which we wound up distributing close to 800 at this point. Um, but uh, we had already uh, uh, connected and, and uh, uh, completed enough, uh, fulfilled enough of an order, uh, if you will, for, from enough agencies that, uh, so we never wound up contacting DeGeorge for that. But over the uh, winter break, I contacted Linda and uh, because we wanted to continue the focus with the veterans over the spring, but we, uh, at, at that time we weren't quite sure what we were gonna do, and, uh, but we decided we were gonna do an or a veterans oral history project. And we wanted to hear the stories, we wanted to record the stories that our students, our faculty, and our community veterans um, had. And so we contacted Linda and, uh, to see if we might uh, be able to participate with that. DeGeorge is a, uh, a veterans housing residency who, mm -hmm. I mean, basically these, these folks would otherwise be <coughs> homeless. Mm -hmm. um, and they come from, many of them, or if not most of them, or all of them come from homelessness. Um, but it's a permanent housing. And, uh, and we have set aside three dates throughout the spring semester where our students could come out as a, as a whole. Of course, they could go anytime they wanted, I suppose. But uh, we set aside three dates, and we just had a, a, an overwhelming response from our students, our faculty. We had <coughs> adjuncts, we had staff that went out. I took my staff out as kind of a, a staff development day, and we just had a blast. We've conducted a couple of interviews there, but more importantly, we've just really connected and, and, uh, and, and built a, a long-term relationship. So we want Linda to, to uh, kind of describe that and talk about what they do and, and how we're, we're partnering with them. Well, I just think you've already done a great job. <laughs> I'm, I'm just wondering, where, where are our backpacks? We never got, a, got all those backpacks. 
Uh, good morning, and uh, my name is Linda Green. I am the director of the DeGeorge at Union Station. Uh, we're located right downtown Houston. Uh, we're right across the street from the old uh, Union Station, which is really now the home of the Astros. And uh, when people call and ask for directions, I just say, however you would get to the baseball field, find it, and we're, we're right across the street. We've been there, uh, will be 12 years, uh, August 17th. We're a permanent housing facility for homeless veterans, or we usually say formerly homeless, because once they come to, to our facility, they now, we create a home. So they're no longer without, without a home. Uh, we're always full, um, which is kind of good, because it <coughs> means that many more veterans are off the street. The sad thing is our waiting list is uh, almost as long as those that we house, and we house 100. Our ages range from 28 to 84. Uh, we have several veterans who have served, uh, our, our newer veterans who have served in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, and our oldest veterans served uh, during the Korean conflict. Um, we have black, white, I have one Native American, we've had one, one Asian, we have men and women. Homelessness really knows uh, no boundaries. Everyone is susceptible to becoming homeless. My newest veteran, I just moved in uh, yesterday, uh, has served 12 years in the United States Army. He did two tours in Iraq, he did three in Afghanistan, and he has an honorable discharge and he holds the rank of a major. He's been living in his car for nine months. Mm -hmm. So he became our newest resident yesterday, and uh, it's very touching when you're working with adult men and, and women, and, and you, you hear them cry, and they tell their stories of, of whatever it was that brought them to, to that, that state. Um, in his particular case, he's from Michigan, he's from Detroit, and when he went back home, there just, there just was nothing available for him there. Um, had some issues, some personal issues with his, with his family. Uh, in, in talking to him and doing an assessment with him, it's, it's very obvious that he uh, is having uh, occurring PTSD, which is very, very common among, among the veterans. So when, when we do an intake, we try and kind of look at a holistic approach and, and we try and you know, get them connected with whatever agency or or whatever group that they need to, you know, to help them, to help them heal and to help them be whole again. Um, we have women. We we only have nine women. Uh, the rest, obviously, being male. Um, women are become homeless for normally for entirely different reasons than a than a man <coughs> does. The majority of men, it's it's very seldom uh, economics. Uh, there are other issues that, that enter into it. A man normally becomes homeless due to alcohol and uh, addiction issues. A woman normally becomes homeless because they're fleeing a domestic abusive situation. However, statistics show us that the longer a woman remains homeless and, and remains on the street, she then turns to the uh, addiction and alcohol issues just sometimes just to self self-medication and, and just as kind of a self-perseverance, I guess it would be, but. Um, Wanna talk about the visits that we have? Yes, yes. Uh, our, our veterans, <coughs> a lot of them are, have isolated. Uh, being homeless is a very isolating behavior. So even though once they're, they're at our facility and, and they have a home and, and, and support, they're, they're still isolating. So. They don't usually go out into the community themselves to, to seek support and, and friends or mentoring. We have to help to bring those groups to them. And we were so delighted to, to work with John and with Carol this year and uh, to have them come down three, three times yes. it's been. And um, it just gives them someone to talk to uh, and, and to become a friend. And I was listening when you were talking about with the children and just reading to, to the children just something as, as simple as just sitting and listening to them and listening to the war stories that, that our veterans can tell, or just, just talking, 
just just having a normal everyday uh, conversation is so so important to them. A lot of them have lost that contact with their family for various personal issues, and it's always very sad to, to me when I see them when they're clean and 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 they're and they're dry and and they maybe have gone back to school or gotten a job and they're they're you know so proud of what they they've become, and we tell them so many times we're so sorry that their family can't see the man or woman that they've now become. But it's really an honor for us to, to, to see and to work with that person. And when uh, the cosmetology group was out a few weeks ago on Saturday, I think everybody in the building got a haircut. And when I came in on Monday, I mean, there was just like a line of people lined up with just that smile on their face. And they had beard trims and, <laughs> and mustache removed and haircuts and all. And they were, they were just so proud. It just, just helped their self-esteem so much. And we really, really appreciated that. And like I said, just, just being a friend and just being there to talk to them and, and, and listen to them. And my, they, they played bingo and they bought down snacks. I, I told Carol, I said, if you want to get them to do anything, bring food, any kind of food. It can be peanut butter crackers. That's okay. And whatever that is, it gets them out of their room. It gets them downstairs, that little carrot, you know, and then, and then they stay. And then they stay because they had a wonderful time with bingo but thank you all so much for making that possible and we just hope you'll come back many yeah. times you're on our list you're going to be one of Good. our agencies i and was telling dave the okay. yeah we have mad and we have the george they're going to be you guys are going to be permanent agencies <laughs> permanent partnerships with the san Jacinto Good. college i'd like to just uh, give some of the student uh, payoffs and benefits uh, from their experiences at the george a uh, couple of my students well john's group actually went first in the february on the february <coughs> date and John and his group actually did an interview, an oral history interview of one of the veterans while uh, his, he and his group were there. And uh, so that was a benefit. And as well, they played bingo and games. Uh, and then when we went, uh, some of my students and Vic Tran's students, I think Mrs. Uh, Professor McKinley's, uh, Liz's students, Elizabeth's students went at another point. Anyhow, uh, my students had this idea. And you know, I, I noticed this is kind of a carryover from high school. Uh, the, the 18, 19 year olds that I have in college prep, they get so excited about fundraisers. So you say fundraiser, yeah, we know how to do that, car washes and da da da. So I mentioned that uh, because Linda and I had talked about the needs, because it's very <coughs> important in the planning process to do a needs assessment of the agency, of the community. And uh, Linda had mentioned, well, they always need bed linens and, and bath towels, because they were only issued one set at their initial uh, and intake. On, and only new. And only, only new. new. Yeah. So uh, I told my students that, and one class, one of my reading classes, got all hyped up about, well, let's raise some money and let's bring, let's do that for bingo prizes. I said, sounds great to me. So they wanted, to, I got approval from Ellie Myers' group that we could sell uh, <coughs> certain purchased items in front of the student center. My uh, my students were out there, and we were getting donations. People were just passing by saying, I don't care for pastry, but here. The response was incredible. I think we did uh, two days and we raised almost $100. It was 90 something dollars. So we took the money. And I had the students, come on, we're going shopping, let's go. <laughs> and uh, we purchased bed linens and bath towels and snacks. And uh, we had our bingo on March 23rd. Our group went, Vic Tran's uh, students were there as well. The students interacted, their listening mm -hmm. skills. I was mostly impressed, because you know they don't listen. Try, you know, five minute mini lecture is uh, maybe I can hold their attention. I do a demo and then they're off. Like so uh, they listened because the interview, you know, the interviews in some of these games, like John did a half hour interview and the students who are the interviewers, because we trained the students to do interviewing and the videography part, thanks to Miss Patience, our uh, expert uh, videographer in the back. Um, and Patience gave all the training and then we talked about uh, interviewing skills. So the students on campus learned those, uh, in some ways, technical skills and communication skills for the interviewing. I also noticed though, that they listened during the game process. They were, they were interacting and focusing and observing and they made comments to me. They'd come up and, and say things about, you know, that veteran, uh, he knows this and he told me and he's interested in what I do too. He wants to know about college. Mm -hmm. So it was an open exchange of information and it empowered the students because they felt important as well. It gave them an historic perspective too. Some of the veterans who did speak of some war experiences, uh, my students who've done interviews 
the oral history interviews at the American Legion Post 521 in Pasadena, as well as here on campus. We've done numerous interviews in John's office, and I, I noticed that they truly listen, uh, and they're gaining perspectives and insights into history. Uh, so I think, and they're getting fascinated by some elements of war and, and government. Uh, they've gained a <coughs> respect and dignity for people, as, especially the veterans. And they've gained a sensitivity, I've noticed. We interviewed, uh, my students interviewed two female veterans. And one of the veteran, female veterans had been sexually uh, molested. Uh, and she gave that uh, detailed uh, account. Uh, and then the other female veteran, when she was interviewed, totally different experience. So two male students were my, my students who did the videography and the interviewing. Actually, there were three students in the room. And after the ladies left, I said, now you realize this is confidential information. And they said, oh, well, we've never divulged the names. But it's so interesting. And they wanted to talk about it. They wanted to talk about abuse and how men sometimes abuse women. They wanted to talk about why these two women's, women's experiences were so different. And so I said, well, let's analyze it. Let's look at it. So I had them uh, go into the details of the interview. Where was that person stationed? Where was this person? Uh, where did she transfer to? And they started making, drawing conclusions. And, and, and they reflected on all of this. It was a, a great thought process into walking in someone else's shoes. Um, so uh, and as for their articles, a lot of my students did choose a PTSD. Uh, information and you'll see some pictures when you go to the kaleidoscope room for lunch you're going to see the pictures of the cosmetology students who uh, did the hair cutting you're going to see a couple of my students projects and the pictures from the de george so uh, it's it's just an invaluable connection and we treasure your time uh, and we're going to get more planning done absolutely uh, so we can connect even better planning is so important so we thank you thank you very much <laughs> You know, if I could just say a little something about, you know, how this does connect. Um, we talked about, you know, with MAD and how it's, it's a national connection. This is going to be a national project now. And, uh, you know, and, and to talk about how it connects to our, to our coursework. And, and it affects our students and it affects us. Um, last semester with the Backpack Project and after doing research and we knew we became aware of some of the agencies, uh, Jim Meeks back there, he had a student, I believe it was you, Jim, who had a student who he uh, discovered was a veteran and was homeless living out of his car. And so we sent him down to my office uh, to see you know, if we could connect him with some agencies and also just to supply him with a backpack full of supplies. This individual was actually, um, he was staying in his car and he was taking showers in our gym. And um, so we supplied him with uh, actually a couple of backpacks uh, over, over course, but we also gave him some contact information and he was able to get in with, uh, with the housing. He's not at DeGeorge, but he was able to get in with one of the other veterans housing agencies. And he is, he, he, uh, he, I believe he passed all of his classes in the fall but he is a student this semester too. I see him all the time and check on him and he's, he's in a home now. His mother actually passed away, but, and he, so he's in, in her home now. But he's, you know, he's, this is a success story um, and it's very touching. And as we were reflecting, my students this semester, as we were reflecting on the oral histories and, and, and that we're doing, um, I had two students in my student success course who stood up and started crying and they, they were both female and they indicated that within the past year they had both been homeless in the streets, on the streets. One had stayed at uh, the Star of Hope Mission for a while. And so it really connected with them. And of course, uh, our oral history project is going to have a national scope as well, because not only are we archiving those histories here on our campus, but we're uh, distributing those to the uh, Library of Congress for their American Folk Center for their uh, veterans oral history projects. So you know what we're doing here at St. Jack, it's touching the lives of our students. It's touching the lives of our faculty and staff and making a real difference, which that's what service learning is all about but it's also um, making a national impact and a historical impact, and I think that's a real important thing. Can I say something about the numbers? Yes. Do we have time? And I just wanted to mention just yes. about the numbers of, of homeless veterans. Like I said, we house 100. Houston has, uh, in Harris County, kind of depending upon which report that you read, anywhere between about 11 to 13,000 homeless individuals. 33% of that number are veterans. So that's going to tell you in, in the Houston area we have you know, roughly pretty close to about 3,000 uh, homeless veterans. Our facility hosts 100. Another agency that we work with has transitional housing. They can house about 200. 
that leaves an awful lot of them still still out on the street. And nationally, <coughs> on any given night, there's close to about 400,000 homeless veterans on the streets, uh, and that, that number's growing. And it's growing larger with women. There's, there's, that, that's the fastest rising numbers. It's women, female and female veterans. Are there any questions? If there's a question, please t talk it into the mic so patients can record it. Any questions? I was just wanting to know what the criteria is for the volunteers um, at DeGeorge. Is there certain things that the volunteers need to go through, background checks or anything? Just uh, give me a call. <laughs> You're hired. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty easy. We don't, we don't do a criminal background check since, since everyone uh, is an adult. We don't, we don't have that, that issue. And we just kind of talk to them and, and find out you know, what, what their interests are, whether it's coming down and playing bingo or are some of our elderly uh, gentlemen sometimes need some help folding their laundry or are just, just someone to talk to. And, and sometimes it can be clerical and answering the phone. We, we, kind of, we find something for anybody. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. Right. Um, and so uh, our board of directors and our staff um, sent me also with the mission. Um, Cheryl, Dr. Pasillo. <laughs> Um, a certificate of recognition and appreciation award to Dr. Sheriff Fasulo for your partnership through education and student community service learning programs that has advanced the mission of MAD and significantly improved the lives of your students and the victims of drunk driving through MAD that MAD serves. And it's signed here, and this certificate is just a small way. We also would like to present to you the highest award that we give to law enforcement. It's a it's a gold coin that we give to law enforcement, to people truly in the trenches that have saved lives. And we feel like because Cheryl allows us it, through San Jack to deal with students that we know that lives have been saved and lives have been changed because of our involvement. So we just want to say thank you so much. a completely unscripted surprise. How wonderful. <laughs>